I want to welcome everybody to um, Medicine Grand Rounds uh, today, February the 1st. Um, today, we uh, are going to hear an update on hot topics in palliative care. And I'm really grateful to Drs. Quest and Cavalierados for presenting for us. I want to introduce um, both of them to you if, if uh, this audience doesn't already know them. Uh, Dr. Tammy Quest is the Montgomery Chair in Palliative Medicine and a professor in the Department of Family and Preventive Medicine, as well as in the Department of Emergency Medicine. She's the Chief of Palliative Medicine for the Division of Palliative Medicine in the Department of Family Medicine. She's the past president of the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine and is director of the Emory Palliative Care Center for Emory's Wood Health Sciences Center. She has been a, uh, a, a, a fixture at our Grand Rounds in years past and is always uh, incredibly popular. Um, I want to welcome Dr. Dio Cavalierados, who is an associate professor of medicine and the director of research and quality for the Emory Palliative Care Center. He is a health services researcher whose federally and privately funded work focuses on models of primary and specialty palliative care delivery and serious illness. He serves in a variety of international leadership roles, including as associate editor of the Journal of Palliative Medicine and co-chair of the Palliative Care Clinical Practice Guideline Development at the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. And so I'm really um, excited to hear you guys um, tell us what's new um, and what uh, is uh, uh, what, what are the topics, what's the buzz about right now in palliative care. And so I will turn it over to each of you. Great. Thanks so much, everybody, for having us. We're really excited to, to be giving this talk this afternoon. Um, and thank you for the introductions. So by way of uh, getting started, uh, here's some disclosures, um, but none that present any conflicts of interest with what we'll be presenting today. In terms of our learning objectives, so by the end of today's talk, we'd like for you to be able to differentiate the concepts of advanced care planning versus advanced care plans versus advanced directives, which Dr. Quest will delineate uh, in her section of the talk. Then we'd like you to be able to understand what the key findings are in the evidence base and what gaps remain regarding advanced care planning, models of palliative care delivery, and where inequities lie in serious illness care across the spectrum. And last but not least, we want to use today's talk as um, a way to highlight opportunities for collaboration across specialties, all in service of advancing the science and quality of serious illness care. Dr. Quest? Hey, everybody. So great seeing everybody um, again in 2D. Uh, would love to uh, be in some big auditorium, and we will do that at some point. Um, we've had enormous growth of palliative care the last um, decade, and um, you all have a lot of uh, exposure now to our clinical palliative care programs. You can see we're everywhere except uh, Emory Hillendale and the long-term acute care uh, part of the DeKalb operating units. We um, have really been successful in growing inpatient, outpatient, and dedicated hospice beds in many of our um, facilities um, and uh, your um, opportunity to work with um, our palliative care teams um, is always um, welcome and our opportunity to learn uh, from you and um, what are the most important things is always um, our pleasure. So um, right now we've got 34 um, attendings in palliative medicine across um, all of our, our sites and um, 20, 24 advanced practice providers as well as an entire outpatient team and 10 social workers. And so we are um, incredibly um, thrilled to be able to be um, to expand and also um, give you all um, opportunities to uh, have joint, joint learning in this topic as we're going to talk today. Um, we've had enormous um, education growth over the years. We have seven uh, fellowship positions, six adults and one pediatric. We have the uh, required uh, third year uh, medical student clerkship and an elective for the fourth year. Uh, we have uh, required rotations for internal medicine, emergency medicine, and family medicine. And our clinical fellowship rotations right now are pain medicine, uh, critical care, geriatrics, and oncology in various um, um, opportunities to work together. So um, excited um, in this grand rounds to see so many uh, folks joining and um, excited that we've been able to um, educate over time. So um, as we get started today, um, we're going to uh, talk about Miss Vicki. And um, Dia, would you like to talk a little bit about Miss Vicki as we get, get ready to talk about her throughout our presentation? Sure. So Miss Vicki is a hypothetical patient case, but informed by um, patients that all of you have probably served 
in the past. Um, so Miss Vicky is, oh, try to, there we go. She's a 63 year old woman who lives in Jackson, Georgia. For those of you who aren't familiar with where Jackson is, which I was not familiar until a couple of days ago. Uh, we'll talk about that in a few slides. She's widowed and has two non-local adult children. So her support system locally is a little bit shaky. Uh, she has class four heart failure as well as a number of comorbidities that are significant in her care. Uh, but she typically sees her community cardiologist about every three to four months um, for checkups. However, over the past year, she's taken a bit of a turn. She's been hospitalized three times with two of those hospitalizations landing her in the ICU. Dr. Quest, turn this one over to you. So she um, executed an advanced directive in 2009 that named her daughter as her uh, legal circuit decision maker, and she chose the option, extend my life as long as possible on her Georgia advanced directive. So many of you have seen those forms, right? There's a part one and a part two. Part one is an opportunity to name your legal surrogate and a two alternates on the Georgia form. Um, and then the um, second portion, uh, major portion of it is where um, you can choose in two conditions. Um, if I have a terminal condition for which uh, we believe that my uh, life expectancy is relatively short, or I'm in a persistent vegetative state, what sort of things uh, would I want? And the choices are, do all things to extend my life, um, allow my natural death to occur, or extend my life um, as long as possible. And that is what she chose in 2009. So a few hot topics that we're going to talk about today um, in our field is um, advanced care planning um, and advanced care plans. I'm going to uh, be a little technical there and talk a little bit about that um, as a new as a controversy. Uh, primary palliative care, Dr. Cavalaratos is going to talk about that. And then we're going to talk about um, inequities in serious illness care as we go along. So um, if uh, some of you uh, may uh, know um, that advanced care planning um, in and of itself is under fire in our field. And so October 26 of 2021, mm -hmm. Um, in the New England, in, sorry, in JAMA, um, was a, uh, a um, editorial um, viewpoint called What's Wrong with Advanced Care Planning? And Drs. Morrison, Meyer, and Arnold are uh, three of the thought leaders in our field um, and have worked in a, um, a number of um, uh, aspects of advanced care planning to include communication skills and um, research and really, um, I would suggest that all of you uh, take a read there um, of this. And it talks about how, despite the intrinsic logic of advanced care planning, the evidence suggests it does not have the desired effect. Many clinicians may be disappointed that promoting conversations with patients well in advance of needed medical decisions has not improved subsequent care as hoped. And so, um, there's a, a couple of things. So there's advanced care planning, which is a dynamic process. There's an advanced care plan that might be documented in somebody's medical record. And there's advanced directive, which is a, um, a, a physical uh, piece of paper that is located most often not where the patient is. It can be at home uh, for safekeeping. It can be in the uh, safety deposit box. Um, it, usually it's not available. Um, less than 10% of Americans have one of those documents. Um, and in this case, Ms. Vicki does. Um, she executed it in 2009 when she was healthy. And actually many people execute their advance directive, the piece of paper, when they are healthy. If you talk to estate planning lawyers, um, it is common that when people do their wills that they also hand them an advance directive and say, this is something you might want to fill out. And so um, that is often how that is done, not with any uh, medical guidance or advice. And so this idea in our field that this advanced care planning, specifically advanced directives have not um, actually in and of themselves changed um, outcomes. There are other things that have, but the advanced directive per se has not. So one of the uh, foci of that uh, viewpoint really talks about this idea that people execute um, an advanced directive typically in a hypothetical state versus the actual. So they are uh, trying to make a future plan about something for which 
um, they have no lived experience. And so the idea that, um, that this um, concept is that um, the current literature suggests that advanced care planning conversations that occur far in advance, now far is relative, is far a month, is it a year, is it a decade, we don't know, uh, but these conversations that occur far in advance hypothetically may not be as valuable as when had during the actual illness. So this is the concept of somebody who has an unfortunate traumatic injury where they lose a um, a, a critical bodily function, such as maybe walking. So they, someone might say, if I was paralyzed, I would not be want to go on. There's no way. And then paralysis occurs and they're able to find new meaning in life. And so this concept that advanced directives that um, we have encouraged people to execute um, in advance of medical illness may actually um, not work uh, because um, of the, their hypothetical nature and that somebody may need to be experiencing serious illness um, during, during that. So it's this idea that we say, oh, people should do this far in advance, but then actually when you get into the situation, people's view changes and this can be really complex. So there is new focus on timing of the conversation in our field. There is a continued focus on the identification of a surrogate decision maker because it's possible that the most valuable thing that you could do is to name a legal surrogate decision maker that can participate in that shared decision making process. But the actual choices we um, that you make in advance, uh, we may we may um, be uh, finding is not as helpful. So there is a complete reevaluation in our field about the concept of the dose. What what is it? What should happen? The content and the timing. So um, the idea is, well, when is, when is too early, when is too late? Um, we have focused on early. That is where the large body of evidence and advanced care planning is early, early, early. Um, and, um, and late, we talk about too late, too late, too late. And then, well, when is just right? And so this is sort of like, you know, the porridge, is it too hot, too cold, or just right? Um, and so that is really where um, our field is going. And I will say that in, in palliative care consultation, we often struggle with this idea that someone has an advanced directive that was executed many years ago. They're now in this current situation and their surrogates feel bound by those choices that were made, not in the context. And so um, this idea of, of trying to get the porridge just right is a new idea. So um, <clears throat> there was um, a response uh, to this um, growing um, topic that I would also um, have you point to is another viewpoint, January 25th. Um, so just uh, very, very recently. Um, and um, they um, start talking more um, about this. So um, this is um, out of the, the Harvard group and they, uh, Julia J uh, Jacobson, um, who is a clinician and researcher, talks about um, this contextual idea that serious illness communication um, that occurs in the context of the serious illness may have far more value. So understanding of difficult prognostic information in context, recalibration of hopes and priorities in context, decisions at the time consistent with their values at the time. So you'll often hear people say, you know, I, I may have done that advanced directive when I didn't have the grandkids, but I want to live for the grandkids, right? Because that is something that has changed over time. So one of the things that Dr. Jacobson and her colleagues have really um, studied in advance, so Atul Gawande um, has um, something called um, the Ariadne Labs. And in Ariadne Labs, what they um, have done is, is um, is surgically studied a serious illness conversation. They have um, looked at what, from a patient-centered perspective, what would patients, what words could we use? And one of the things that they've come up with something called the serious illness conversation guide. And there's a picture of it there right next to Vital Talk. Vital Talk um, is a training program that is more advanced around having serious illness conversations. Um, but this conversation is a is a templated set of questions that have been trialed with patients um, around um, key 
um, aspects of a conversation. So opening a serious illness conversation, assessing prognostic awareness, sharing worry, aligning, exploring what's important, making recommendations, and then documenting um, the conversation. Um, that this concept of serious illness communication um, really is, is an evolving conversation that you may have once, you may have it 20 times, but it is contextual. And so this is uh, something that's gaining incredible traction in our field. So we here um, at Emory have tried to uh, bring the serious illness conversation um, guide in its templated fashion, trying to see if we could um, see what our own experience is. And we uh, formed a work group now over a couple of years um, now, and you can see some of the participants. It's an um, um, interdisciplinary group here. Um, and what we have uh, been doing is creating, um, there's, there's training that occurs um, in this guide, this templated guide. Um, and it could be coming to uh, you um, at some point. We currently now at Emory have nine serious illness trainers um, in internal medicine, family medicine, emergency medicine, critical care, um, and uh, radiation oncology. Um, the total number of clinicians we've trained um, at this point, I would say that we've we've had uh, spurts and starts because of um, our COVID waves and and all sorts of um, things that have have uh, diverted our attention. Um, yet we've managed to train 33 clinicians in this guide to use with their patients. We've had 19 physicians, uh, 13 advanced practice providers, and one nurse across a number of specialties to include primary care, critical care, medical, cardiac, and neuro, general internal medicine, family medicine, surgery, and geriatrics. And so um, what some of our participants have said so far, and mind you, um, in other organizations, these conversations have, have been had thousands and thousands of times. Um, we are uh, coordinated with uh, the Penn Group, um, where they've had uh, tens of thousands of these conversations um, with their clinicians. And so you can see we're here at our very small number, but we're hoping that we'll have log logarithmic growth. Um, some of our participants said, this is a good opportunity to address health disparities. The SIG allows us to give everyone the opportunity to share in these conversations. Somebody else said, from someone who doesn't work in palliative but sees a lot of missed opportunities, this is a more manageable way to have conversations we don't do, do all day, every day. Um, and so this guide is meant for the generalist. It's not meant for the palliative care um, uh, subspecialist where we're seeing thousands and thousands um, of patients with serious illness um, and doing this day in and day out. Um, and so anybody that's interested in serious illness uh, training for your group, please throw it in the chat. Um, but you can see here that we are, uh, we are trying to proliferate. Um, and when the EPIC build comes for Emory, we will uh, be able to have that, those documentation templates. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Cavalaratos for a moment and let him um, uh, kind of explore our next hot topic. Thanks, Dr. Quest. So let's take it back to Ms. Vicki uh, to ground our next section. So again, um, she has, oh, let's go back there. There we go. Having some Zoom issues. There we go. Great. So again, so let's think about Ms. Vicki, right? So she very likely has a number of palliative needs, right? I think it's it's a little bit of a no-brainer here that she's she probably is in need of, of more conversations about her goals of care. She probably has symptom needs. She probably has other care needs, right? But when we think about what are her options for palliative care, they're probably quite limited. So going back to thinking about where she's located, again, she's in Jackson, Georgia in Butts County, which is about 60 minutes south of Atlanta. Um, importantly, there are no palliative care services in any Butts County hospital. Um, if, if there might be an inpatient palliative care service, it's likely small, and it's likely probably skewed towards uh, patients with cancer, as we often see in national trends. But importantly, there are no outpatient palliative care programs, so she, she has really no access um, to receive longitudinal palliative care. 
And this slide comes from the Center for Advanced, Center to Advance Palliative Care's uh, national report card that they put out each year. And what we can sort of quickly take from this is that specialty palliative care services are quite geographically maldistributed. And this actually is even an overestimate because uh, the metric for this report card is large hospitals with palliative care services. So even small community hospitals quite often are underrepresented in this report card. So all that to say, Specialty palliative care services, again, are largely concentrated in tertiary or quaternary care centers and really thinking about outpatient palliative care services, for, especially for individuals with non-cancer illnesses like Miss Vicky, are quite rare across the country. So we really ought to be thinking about what are sort of new models of palliative care to enhance spread. Just to sort of cover quickly, you know, as we think about what are the barriers to widespread palliative care, there are numerous ones. So the first one is that... Um, we have data to suggest that uh, about 40% of the palliative care workforce is experiencing burnout. And these estimates come pre-COVID. Uh, a couple of papers that we had um, collaborated on, and, and these are only a few here, again, suggest that it's about, the burnout rate is about 40%. And there's a number of different factors operating here from the personal level to interpersonal to organizational and systems level factors that influence burnout in the palliative care workforce. Clinician misperceptions of what palliative care is and is not. Oftentimes we see in the literature study after study where clinicians might perceive palliative care as an option of last resort or that it will reduce patient hope. There's actually a really brilliant paper uh, recently published in JAMA on the, on the topic of hope and serious illness that I'd recommend anybody look towards. Um, first authored by Abby Rosenberg from the University of Washington. Um, and so we have, number, we have a number of different articles in, in a number of different disease states. This uh, paper is in cardiology, again, sort of trying to break the notion that palliative care is this option of last resort and really trying to push the needle towards early palliative care involvement and disentangling the idea that uh, palliative care is synonymous with hospice or end of life care, which it is not. As I talked about earlier, uh, there is geographic maldistribution. Importantly, 90% of hospitals uh, with palliative care do are in urban areas. So people like Miss Vicky um, have limited resources for palliative care exposure. And last but not least, oftentimes financial incentives are misaligned for palliative care growth. And we'll cover this in a few slides to come. So all that to say, we're at a turning point where we need to think about how do we break reliance on um, simply thinking that all palliative care should be uh, delivered by palliative care specialists, and how do we move the needle towards uh, enhancing scale and spread of palliative care? Some of you may have seen this piece in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2013, pushing for sort of this, this newer model or generalist plus specialist palliative care, um, bringing forth the notion of generalist or primary palliative care. And you might ask, what is that? So let's, uh, let's talk about that for a second. So when we think about primary palliative care, it's the notion that any clinician, regardless of specialization, is able to assess and manage basic or lower level palliative concerns. So here we, we see this as basic management of pain and symptoms, basic management of depression or anxiety, and basic discussions of prognosis, goals of care, suffering, and code status. And when those needs become complex or intractable, then we think about um, involving palliative care specialists. But again, thinking about how do we get palliative care exposure um, to individuals like Ms. Vicky, who might not have access to pal specialty palliative care services in her local hospital, doesn't have access to an outpatient palliative care clinic. How do we get those palliative care competencies, those core skills um, in uh, her cardiologist's office, in her primary care provider's office? That really is the notion behind primary palliative care. So what's the evidence for primary palliative care? In 2016-17, we published a systematic review and meta-analysis of about 50 randomized clinical trials of palliative care interventions, both primary and specialty. And then we did a secondary analysis of that systematic review, looking uh, comparing the differences between specialty and primary palliative care interventions. And overall, what we found was that um, primary palliative care interventions are quite often much more focused. They typically focus on symptom management or initiating goals of care conversations, but they're less comprehensive than specialty palliative care services, which is understandable. They're more often to, uh, likely to be implemented in non-clinic settings. So for example, in patients' homes or by telemedicine. 
and they're more often delivered by APPs, nurses, and social workers. So really, even from the evidence that we have so far about primary palliative primary palliative care, we can see some of the reasons why primary palliative care models may be, um, may be desirable or maybe have advantages to, again, enhancing the spread and scale of primary palliative care or palliative care skills um, across the country. Some of you may have seen the study that came out a few months ago. This was published in JAMA Internal Medicine. This was a large uh, randomized, cluster randomized clinical trial of a primary palliative care intervention for uh, individuals with advanced cancer. This was the CONNECT study led out of the University of Pittsburgh. Um, and what this was was uh, patients with uh, a life expectancy of less than one year receiving regular oncology care were either randomized to receive this CONNECT intervention plus usual care or usual care alone. What the CONNECT intervention was, um, was a primary palliative care intervention. So they trained uh, infusion room nurses uh, in primary palliative care skills using a structured curriculum, and then uh, had them delivering these skills uh, to patients in regular visits with monthly check-ins over the phone. Uh, and and the, the usual care arm, receive standard oncology care. 17 oncology clinics across Western Pennsylvania. So again, a large study. And their primary outcome was quality of life as measured by the FACET PAL instrument, which is um, based from the FACT instruments, um, but tailored towards serious illness. Um, the overall takeaway was at three months, there was no difference in quality of life um, between those two groups, which raised a lot of uh, questions about what is the role of primary palliative care? Do we have evidence for it? Does this work? There's a lot of lessons learned from this trial. I think a lot of folks sort of thought, all right, we've, we've put the nail in the coffin for primary palliative care. Instead, actually, if you look at this study, there's actually a lot of lessons learned and a lot of room for us to grow the evidence base and grow our methods for how we study and implement primary palliative care. A couple of those that I'd like to cover here. So really, uh, when we think about how do you begin to study primary palliative care? So this is re really a big point for me here. And thinking about if primary palliative care is this notion that it is um, attention to basic sources of suffering, it is inherently a lower dose, or it is a dilute version of palliative care, and one that probably requires cumulative exposure over time to take effect, which is really difficult to study in a five-year R01 grant. Right? It's also really hard to think about when do you initiate this intervention in the CONNECT trial, if you remember those, those patients had a expected life expectancy of less than one year. So is there perhaps a mismatch in the intervention strength and the population? That population likely required a higher dose of palliative care. And perhaps again, there's this mismatch. Importantly, how do you ensure fidelity of the intervention? So one of the challenges that they encountered in that trial was uh, patients missing appointments, as well as the content of the intervention, perhaps not always being stand uniformly um, delivered. So when you're thinking about implementing primary palliative care in clinic, you know, oncology clinics or uh, in other studies that we're doing here at Emory and, and cardiology clinics in the community, how do you ensure that those elements of primary palliative care are being delivered um, consistently over time? And importantly, how do you reimburse for primary palliative care? A lot of times when we see primary palliative care interventions take hold, there's a lot of investment from the health system or the clinic that is taking place and offsetting time, for example, for nurses or APPs delivering the intervention. And again, really thinking about how do you bill for this and how do you ensure that it is sustained once a five-year R01 trial ends? So all this to say that the evidence base continues to grow for primary primary palliative care, but requires a lot of a lot more sophistication in how we're studying it and how we're implementing it. Dr. Quest? Yeah, so thanks. Um, we're now going to uh, continue on with Ms. Vicki here. And um, as um, Dio just mentioned, that she didn't have any access to outpatient palliative care um, and, uh, you know, there, that would not be um, unusual. She's 60 minutes from Atlanta, um, but there you, there you go. And so we are seeing her in these um, interventions um, when she's in the hospital and when she's in uh, the critical, critical care um, setting for which we have um, the opportunity to stabilize her. And then when she um, goes back um, to her community, then um, we're, we're seeing those gaps. 
So one of the things um, that um, has come up, and now I'm showing you what Miss Vicki looks like. Um, she is an African American woman, and we had not uh, revealed that. Um, and it should should theoretically not be important, um, but yet um, this is there are some important realities. And so uh, we're going to talk about Miss Vicky's um, experience or what her um, what some of her concerns are um, about the healthcare system and um, and her not uh, feeling like the healthcare system might treat her fairly. So um, this is uh, some work by the Kaiser Family Foundation. Um, they're working a lot in disparities. Um, and what you see here is um, an analysis um, that was uh, done here for um, a number of healthcare measures. And so you'll see there are 27 um, healthcare measures um, that was um, um, that were uh, examined, and you'll see here that uh, the uh, orange box is that if the baseline is uh, is uh, white um, Americans, um, that orange is anything orange means that that um, group did worse than white Americans. Um, anything that's green is that that group did better than white Americans in outcomes as they're measured. Blue is no difference, and then their data limitations. And you'll see here that um, that uh, Black, uh, American Indian, Alaska Native, and Hispanics um, did anywhere between uh, 14 to 19 uh, different conditions worse uh, than than uh, their white counterparts. And so, um, as we think through. Um, multiple patients that have multiple chronic conditions doing more poorly, um, there is a, a lifetime um, of, of experience or your healthcare lifetime, whatever that is, if that's that you're ill for 10 years or 20 years um, with, you know, she's had diabetes, hypertension, COPD, a number of health conditions that you can see here um, that if she were uh, one person there, she would uh, be a black uh, woman who uh, potentially had done, had done worse. Um, in many of those health conditions. Um, and you can see here that um, Asian Americans um, actually do better um, than, um, than their white counterparts in many um, health conditions. And of course that deserves uh, further study, but you can see here that as we think through what somebody's um, lifetime illness experience is, oftentimes, particularly in acute care settings, we uh, focus on the escalating um, uh, care that folks are needing um, as their serious illness or their illness has become serious, but yet there is a longitudinal um, concern here. And I know that we have many primary care providers here who are working very hard um, as well as specialists in, um, in trying to uh, um, e equalize um, this disparity. So um, what we are more focused on, I think, than ever before um, particularly with uh, COVID-19 and us being able to have undeniable um, disparities um, in, many, um, in many ways that we perhaps had not expected. Um, but this, I love this infographic. It talks about um, just very keenly how health disparities are driven by social and economic um, in inequities. So there's um, economic stability, neighborhood and physical environment, education, food, community safety and social context and the healthcare system that all needs to be working uh, well uh, for, uh, for you to have um, outcomes. And when there's racism and discrimination that cross cuts um, these, um, you, can, um, you can imagine um, that those disparities are magnified. At the end of it, when it's all working well, um, your health, health and well-being with respect to uh, mortality, morbidity, life expectancy, healthcare expenditures, health status, functional uh, limitations. Um, when you look at this, all of these factors um, for those outcomes and how people get to their serious illness and end of life, um, we, we are, are paying more attention than ever um, to these factors. And so um, in talking to Ms. Vicki, um, uh, you know, you, you have her admitted on one of these um, uh, sort of episodic uh, uh, instances. She's been out of the ICU, transferred to the floor. And um, as you talk with her about what some of her concerns are, she says, you know, you just don't really understand. And you say, what? You know, tell me more about it. Um, and she shares with you this 
um, that she has on her phone that she keeps. It's a, a, a screenshot um, of a headline from um, a year ago in her local community news where um, they were calling for the resignation of the, of the sheriff um, over a racist incident. And she talks about, um, she shares with you um, the disparities in her community and how blacks live on one side of town and the whites live on the other side of town and how um, she's just not sure um, that her doctor has her best, best interest at heart. And so she starts pouring out to you um, that she is, is not very um, confident in the care that she's had um, over her, um, her illness trajectory. And she, um, she is telling you that um, these are the this is the basis of some of her concerns uh, regarding um, some of the advanced care planning conversations around what things may or may not be helpful to her. Um, and is it that um, that those things are being um, offered to her, either offered to her or not offered to her in a, in a fair fashion. And so um, we'd love to believe that maybe that's just Ms. Vicki's, um, you know, single lived experience. But um, <clears throat> I think this is a, a very important study for people to um, actually read. Um, and it's from the Journal of Pain and Symptom Management in 2016 by Elliot and colleagues. And um, they actually did um, a very a high fidelity study on uh, physician body language and communication in patients who were at end of life. And what they found was that the verbal communication uh, was similar, but the nonverbal communication was very different. That the white physicians were less likely to touch or make eye contact with the non-white patient more likely to stand by the door. And so as we know in communication that the that a large portion of, um, of communication is nonverbal, that the cues that patients are getting regarding um, if they're being treated fairly um, is more than just the word. So we can have the serious illness conversation um, and we might be able to say the words, but, um, but it also um, is, is sort of the, the, the nonverbals. Um, and so um, I think this is a, a really um, good study that will highlight some of the disparities that, um, that patients um, are experiencing. The other thing um, that is a hot topic on this is really um, racial and ethnic disparities in place of death. Um, is place of death a good outcome measure? So um, if you um, have a comfortable home with uh, 300 uh, thread count sheets like um, like I have the ability to have, um, am I more likely to want to be there um, as opposed to if I'm um, living um, in a, an unstable housing, uh, perhaps where I'm not sure if we're going to be able to pay the rent next month. And so uh, being able to say I want to go home with hospice um, is a challenge. And so this idea that patients are in the hospital or place of death um, you know, why are they in the hospital that, that having a more sophisticated um, understanding regarding um, disparities and um, all of the um, structural um, uh, disparities that we see um, are being uh, um, proliferated in our society is place of death in and of, of itself um, a, good, um, a good thing uh, and or is that the only thing or should, you know, how should we be looking at that? And I will tell you that up until this point that uh, typically place of death has been looked at as the explanatory model of uh, patients are coming because they want more aggressive end of life care. But what we haven't done is looked at some of those socioeconomic factors as to why somebody might um, have an end of life experience. And so as you look at this um, data here um, in population health, you'll see here that um, whites were uh, more likely to use hospice care, less likely um, to have um, an end of life um, experience um, in the hospital. And so as we start looking at some of those disparities, um, I think that we need to be um, thinking uh, more about the why and not just the what. Um, so as we challenge uh, in our field paradigms of say things like location of death, or things like hospice usage, right? So um, to have um, uh, hospice um, at end of life, it is typically um, a uh, more, more patients receive that at home. There are very few inpatient hospice facilities. 
Um, to receive your end of life care at home, it means that you have to have a caregiver. It means that as you get sicker, you need to have a 24 hour caregiver that is not paid for by hospice um, or insurance um, in general. And so um, if you have families that are, um, are barely making it uh, financially or even those who are doing well, um, it can be very difficult to have a, a home caregiver. So being able to look at the Medicare hospice benefit and are there um, structural aspects of the Medicare hospice benefit, like needing a caregiver um, and um, limiting access to inpatient hospice and um, asking that patients forego things when they haven't had those things, um, is um, hospice use at end of life as well as location death, are the location of death, are those things that we need to look at. So um, we need to be thinking more about um, elements of structural racism and um, injustice um, that have occurred um, along um, a patient's uh, care and um, life trajectory and lived experience. And we just haven't gotten uh, to that yet in our field, but um, we are getting there. So um, really the punchline there is that serious Ill illness care um, really is going to be inseparable from life's experiences. And so um, I, would, um, I would caution anybody here as patients and families are making um, end of life decisions that may seem more um, on the side of um, choosing life-sustaining therapies that uh, that could be far more complicated um, than we ever um, have um, discovered at this point in our literature. So we are going to be rethinking it all um, in our field. So what research tools, what are our gold standards of quality? We're going to be ex examining um, the hospice care benefit and also communication and um, not just what um, our, our patients um, and families um, hear, um, but um, what, what is their um, illness trajectory and how are they being treated? So I'm going to turn it uh, back over. Great. Thanks, Dr. Quest. So now for the last part of today's talk, we want to sort of wrap things up, talk a little bit about um, how we here at Emory are exploring uh, equity and serious illness um, across a number of different facets, uh, and as well as some upcoming work, and inviting some conversation around, again, ways that we can collaborate across specialties and disciplines to enhance the science and equity for serious illness care. So as Dr. As Dr. Quest mentioned, um, well, let's there we go. Uh, so as Dr. Quest mentioned, um, outcomes uh, differ between individuals with different races or eth ethnic backgrounds, um, as we'll show in another slide uh, to come. Um, and as I've mentioned earlier, patients with non-cancer illnesses are less likely to receive palliative and hospice care by virtue of the disease that they have and by virtue of the treatments that are required um, for their disease. We also know that people who are experiencing poverty are, are likely to receive more aggressive care. Um, in terms of geography, we know that, again, that concentration of palliative care services in large or academic medical centers leave gaps in access for people, again, like Ms. Vicky in non-urban settings. And as Dr. Quest mentioned, uh, as, the, as the way the hospice benefit is currently written, it may disenfranchise individuals who don't have um, strong support systems at home. For example, like Ms. Vicky, who is widowed and has two non-local adult children. So I wanted to highlight one project that we just wrapped up, um, looking at uh, hospice ac access inequities by disease. So the rationale behind the study was that, um, as many of us are familiar with, the Medicare hospice benefit was really developed with an oncology frame of mind, and so is there equity for individuals who have non-cancer illnesses? So the aims of this study were to investigate if diagnosis, um, treatment complexity, and or treatment costs is associated with the hospice's willingness to accept an individual to their service. This was born out of um, some anecdotal evidence that we had um, where a, a palliative care nurse practitioner once came to me and said, you know, I have, uh, I have patients with heart failure and I just can't get hospices to take them if they're on X, Y, and Z regimen. And so we thought, actually, let's investigate this empirically. So what we did was we created a randomized vignette-based survey of hospice decision makers, and we varied three variables. So it was the disease that they had, either heart failure or cystic fibrosis. And there, were, there was rationale behind that, which we can talk about during the Q&A session if folks are interested in. 
We varied the cost of their regimen for symptom management, so either high cost or low cost. The low cost regimen was offset by a GoFundMe that the hypothetical family had to cover their treatment regimen. And we then varied complexity, so either high complexity treatment regimen or low complexity. And individuals who responded to the survey were randomized to one of these six vignettes. So overall, uh, 495 individuals participated in this survey. And the punchline here was that individuals who have costly or complex symptom management needs are less likely to be accepted to hospice care. This is a really complex study, and so I'm boiling it down to one punchline here. But the study is actually in press, the journal, journal, journal of General Internal Medicine. So the implications here are that the Medicare hospice benefit as currently designed may be contributing to some inequities based on the disease that somebody has and the complexity of their regimen that they need for symptom management. I want to highlight really quickly uh, that this study was actually led and is being first authored by uh, an internal medicine resident here at Emory, Elizabeth Trandall, uh, who actually was a medical student back at the University of Pittsburgh before she came here and we worked together before she came here. So shout out to Elizabeth. Uh, on that study being accepted for publication. To highlight some other work that we're doing in the Division of Palliative Medicine regarding equity. So we have a number of studies looking at models of palliative care delivery, both primary palliative care interventions. So like I mentioned, there's still a lot of work left to be done uh, in terms of the sophistication that we need for the methods of studying and implementing primary palliative care. One study that we have upcoming is an optimization study to really look at the various um, factors in a primary palliative care intervention to enhance fidelity and efficacy for individuals with heart failure being uh, treated, for, treated in community cardiology clinics. Um, we also have a number of studies going on about uh, how do we embed specialty palliative care services and other service lines, really thinking about enhancing access and collaboration between palliative medicine and other disciplines. For example, we have um, a study going on in cystic fibrosis and another study um, potentially upcoming in transplant. We're also thinking about how do we enhance enhance care for vulnerable populations. So uh, one of our faculty members, Dr. Jane Lowers, is, is conducting work to think about what are the care gaps that are experienced by people who are aging without caregivers? For example, if you don't have somebody at home, does that disenfranchise you from accessing the Medicare hospice benefit, as well as what other care needs might you have um, that might otherwise go unmet? Last but not least, we uh, have a really brilliant postdoc in our program who is interested in looking at the role of poverty, structural racism, and neighborhood factors uh, in terms of serious illness care outcomes using methodologies like uh, geospatial analysis and hot spotting. So really a lot of unanswered questions in serious illness care and plenty of opportunities for us to be crossing um, boundaries and working across specialties to collaborate here. So we invite those collaborations and would love to spend the next couple of minutes talking about what those collaborations might look like. So overall summarizing today's talk, uh, we'd like to point out that advanced care planning again is a, is a dynamic process and not a discrete event that we need to be thinking about innovative models of palliative care delivery, both primary and specialty palliative care, all in service of the goal of enhancing access and meeting population demands um, for unmet palliative care needs. And last but not least, as Dr. Quest mentioned, rethinking our methods, rethinking our approaches, and rethinking our assumptions about how do we disentangle and intervene upon structural and sociocultural factors that may be impeding high quality, uh, equitable, serious illness care. So with that, we'd love to open things up for questions at this point. Thank you both so much. Um, that was really phenomenal and, um, and incredibly topical for the work that I do. Um, and I really appreciate bringing the equity lens to this uh, discussion, which um, uh, is, is obvious, but is not something I've actually heard discussed in this way um, before. And so it was really fantastic. Um, as someone who uh, uh, cares for people um, with sort of complex illnesses, that uh, complex chronic illness, um, you know, I, I also was really struck by how hard it is to study and the primary palliative care approach and, and, and the quest to try and sort out the best approach. What do you advise, you know, primary care physicians 
to do sort of now, not knowing what perfection is and not knowing what the right dose is and everything else? Like, what should we be doing? What's like practical advice? So I think, you know, a couple, oh, Dr. Cresta, do you want to take this? Yeah. So I will just say that um, communication is always a great place to start. <laughs> and uh, the reason that we're focused on the serious illness communication um, is, is because of its accessibility and ease. Um, I think, um, I think communication is, is fundamental. And so as we talked about uh, verbal and nonverbal, um, that while we need to certainly um, uh, be mindful of our, of our nonverbal, um, if we don't have even the verbal aspect of it, we're really um, a little bit uh, behind the eight ball. So I would just say that, um, that that's, that's one of them. The other thing, and um, Dia is probably gonna say more about this, but this idea of having a subspecialist um, available to you in clinic may actually enhance the primary palliative care, right? So working side by side. So what we don't know is if you have somebody who's, who's in your sphere. So if I'm working next to you and you're like, oh, that's a tip. Um, so trying to figure out what are some of the models of, of dissemination, I don't think we have that. Yeah, spot on. I, I think, you know, thinking about sort of the, in some ways, that idea actually makes it really difficult to study because it, it, it involves contamination, right? It, you can't, you don't have clean control and intervention groups. But on the other hand, it's actually beautiful because it does show rapid spread of those skills. Um, I think the other thing is, you know, there are existing curricula out there. There are existing resources out there for enhancing um, skills in symptom management and communication. We can point you to those resources, but they do exist. And so, um, I think that that is also a place to start. And can I um, quickly ask you, um, I also love the idea of the serious um, illness communication skills um, sessions that you guys are hosting. What is the size of group that's the appropriate size if we were to come to you with proposals to do some of that work with us? Yeah, we are um, typically, so what's really nice now, I'm going to say that probably six-ish, I mean, there's there's just different ways to, to do it with Zoom, um, depending on, uh, we have more trainers now, so that's really exciting. And so you can do a lot more on Zoom um, than, you, um, than you could do before in person. And so typically groups of six or so, but with multiple trainers, you can, you can scale that. So we want to, um, we're just really excited because we just this, this latest, um, kind of crop, if you will, um, are, are chomping at the bit. So we, um, any, any number would be great. Ted, can I ask you to go ahead and ask your question? Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Tammy and Dio. That was awesome. I know that Dr. Morrison is provocative at, at times. And, and so I'm curious about his whether he's thrown the baby out with the bathwater or whether he's spot on in, in questioning one of those underlying assumptions in palliative care. Yeah. Um, thanks, Ted, that's a great question. So I think that interestingly, when this was first released, I think a lot of us, um, it either resonated with you or you rejected it, right? So it, it kind of got this, this rile. Um, I will say that I'm more in the Morrison camp than I am not. Um, for many years, I felt that a poorly executed advanced directive um, is way more harmful um, to patient care than, a, than no advanced care planning document at all. So um, if I have that document and it, and it binds you to something that is not contextual, um, that can be really tough. Um, and I have seen so many um, surrogates angst and keep their loved one alive with all sorts of interventions that they say, I don't really think that she would have wanted this, but that's what she wrote down. And, and that's my obligation. And so, so I've seen, I've seen people with no advanced care planning documents have what I think is a, is a beautiful value laden contextual experience. I've seen people have advanced care planning documents who also have that and I have seen people who have advanced care planning documents and have horrific experiences, as well as those who don't have, who, who don't have them have, have horrific experiences. And so I will just say that it rings true to me 
that having a legal circuit makes sense and having context makes sense and being able to revisit something in the context of value and information makes sense. So I think they're right. I mean, is, is really what I'm going to say. Um, and I think they couldn't couldn't do couldn't maybe communicate that in a nuanced fashion. I think that it's just sort of where, where it is. And so um, so we are um, we we are. I, I will just say that that's where I am on that topic, if that makes sense. So well, we are at the top of the hour, and so I want to thank you both so much for joining us today and presenting at Edison Grand Rounds. Um, this has been terrific, and I think has. Um, really given me an additional or new lens to, to really uh, uh, grapple with some of the challenges that, that, that really we face clinically um, far too often. So thank you so much. And, um, uh, and I actually look forward to thinking about how to, think, uh, to take you up on the, the offer to do some, some trainings. We look forward to the opportunity to be overwhelmed. <laughs> thank you guys.